I saw someone compare Dembele to Gareth Bale. Have some respect for Gareth Bale. He is a three-time Champions League winner. He scored in the final in Lisbon and in the final in Kiev. Have some respect for Mr. Gareth Bale. Alright, what's happening everyone? Welcome to yet another episode of VMFC. My name is Alex Perez and if you looked at me a little bit closely and in detail, you can tell that I no longer have any facial hair that went away after the football season officially ended. That is my tradition. I've been doing that for two years now and I feel like a five-year-old. Not only do I act like a five-year-old, but I feel like a five-year-old, um, and I also added a little bit more more foam to the microphone. I'm pretty sure none of you noticed, but since I'm such a geek when it comes to microphones, cameras, and all of that stuff, I had to point it out. And the shot is a little bit wider too. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I had to do a little bit more justice. There, there has to be more justice to this to this cool setup. It, it, it's pretty unique. I have to give myself props for um, for doing the most that I can in my room. Um, but anyway, not that you guys care or anything like that. We have a great show. Absolutely a great show like we have for the last month. Five episodes in already. Wow, it's crazy. We're going to talk about Atletico Madrid. We're going to talk about Liverpool, Real Madrid, Bayern. We're going to talk about the January transfer window, even though it's February by the time you guys see this, February 5th. Um, and a whole lot more. But before we begin all of that... You have to follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at Veterans Minimum. You can like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Veterans Minimum. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this. It is very likely that you are on our YouTube channel. Subscribe. Please, subscribe. We've been at that point where we're like at 11,000. We're very close to getting to 12. Help us get to 12. 12, Tom Brady wears number 12. Yeah. You get the reference, all right? Um, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. Uh, there's going to be, you know, new content, different content now that the football season is officially over. And support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash veterans minimum. I always have to burp when I do this. I don't know why. I haven't ate anything in like three hours, but whatever. Patreon.com slash veterans minimum, a dollar a month. We'll get you exclusive content, merch, early releases, and much, much more. I am getting really good at all of these plugs. Nick, I need a raise. Um, let's get started. If there was a team that had a great preseason this past uh, 2019, it was definitely Atletico Madrid. They were very exciting, especially... Uh, because they beat Real Madrid 7-3 in New York. They beat them 7-3. So they beat the brakes off of their city rivals. And not only that, the signings that they made in the summer transfer window, on paper, they looked very good. They looked like signings that were going to pan out to be just really good. And probably, you know, they were going to end up being signings that we were going to talk about for for a long time. They look good on paper. And then that's about it. And then the season started and Atletico Madrid kind of fell down. They started fading into a reality that they were soon to figure out that was going to be their reality for perhaps the rest of the season. A lot of nil-nil draws, a lot of just draws, period. They couldn't seem to get a win to save their lives. They dropped points to Real Sociedad, who actually turned out to be one of the surprise teams in La Liga. They dropped points in the Champions League. Not, not really that it matters much, but you lose to Bayer Leverkusen, a team that, you know, is so-so in the Bundesliga, and you lose to them. Um, they were eliminated in the Copa del Rey quickly. To a team that's in the like third division. That shouldn't happen. Especially with all the money that they spent. And they lost to Real Madrid in the Super Cup. And this past weekend. They lost to Real Madrid. In the Spanish League. And speaking of that. Of that game. 
I sat down to watch Real Madrid against Atletico Madrid this past Saturday. And I have to say, I was just very disappointed. I feel like I'm always disappointed when I watch these games. But I was very disappointed. I didn't really like what I saw. Because I saw it with a different eye. Before when I was watching Atletico Madrid, I would see them as, you know, just a a team that competed against the big teams. A side that would give a lot of problems and issues to Real Madrid, to Barcelona, to whoever they faced in the Champions League, whether it was Bayern Munich or Chelsea or, I don't know, whoever they would face. They would always give them fits. Part of that, of course, was the style that they played with. Now, with all the signings, with all the attacking signings that these th- that this team has, you expect them to play a little differently. And I didn't see anything different from this team. I do have to point out, though, in the first half, Atletico played pretty well for like a 15-minute period. They had a lot of chances. They created a lot of opportunities off of the counter. And they missed a lot. They just missed a lot. They couldn't seem to score the ball, to score a goal, to put the ball in the back of the net, even though Morata was um, was their striker. And, you know, when he, he's hit or miss, we'll talk about him a little later. But for those 15 minutes, Atletico played very well, but they couldn't seem to score. They, they, they just couldn't score. They couldn't put the ball in the back of the net, and that was a big issue. That's, that's been an issue throughout the entire season. We just talked about their nil-nil draws. But then what was more worrying wasn't so much that they didn't score. What was worrying was how much they fell in in a span of a few minutes. I mean, to be fair to them, they went into halftime and they kind of had the upper hand even though the game was tied. Real Madrid made a few adjustments and Diego Simeone failed to react to those. He didn't adjust properly to the adju- to the adjustments that Real Madrid made. And that was part of the reason why they lost. Um, we'll talk about Real Madrid in, in the next segment. But their team was very compact. It was very narrow. There was nothing going on on the wings. They bring on wingers. V- Vinicius comes on. Uh, Lucas Vasquez comes on. And Real Madrid just looks completely different. They play better, they play wide, the fullbacks start to link up and make overlaps, and they begin to attack through the wings. That's what Real Madrid was doing, and Atletico was like, whoa, what's going on? I was expecting Diego Simeone to to do something about that, and he did do something about it, but he didn't react properly. He did the incorrect thing. I was expecting him to keep Morata and to bring on a winger. He took out Morata, and he brought on Thomas Lamar. That was actually before the goal, if I'm not mistaken. Um, He failed to adjust to how Real Madrid was playing in the second half. Again, I I just mentioned that substitution, taking out his striker. It it turns out that he was injured or whatever, but when a player is injured and things aren't going as bad or you don't want to switch up the the system, you don't want to switch up what you're doing. You change the player just based on the position. You don't you don't change a striker to bring on a center back. You don't take out a center back to bring on a striker. You don't do that if you're content with what what is going on. So it was clear that Simeone was not happy with what was going on on the pitch, but he just didn't make the proper reads. Um, again, he he kept that defensive midfield duo, which, by the way, Marcos Llorente was just a body. He was just a body throughout the entire game. He was inaccurate in the passing, and defensively, he just wasn't very sound. And when you when you play for Atlético Madrid, and when you play that position, when you play defensive midfielder, you have to be defensively sound. You you ha- you can't be afraid to make the tackle. And you have to be very good when you're passing the ball. Because the game just has to be fluent. It just has to keep going. And Atletico Madrid just, they they couldn't do that. So, had I been coaching Atletico Madrid, which I'm not, obviously. I'm doing a show about talking about their coach. But what I would have done if I was Diego Simeone, I would have taken out Llorente and Morata. Obviously, you know, he, he 
probably wasn't going to play. And you know what? I made notes on, on how I would have played. I would have taken out Llorente. I would have put Saul in that spot. I would have brought on Saponjic, um, who's their new striker. He's like 18 years old, played for Benfica. He didn't even bring him on. He probably didn't even look at him, Simeone. He's like, you know what? I, I have a striker, but whatever. Um, and then I would have played with Vitolo and Lamar on the wings. After a while, also, I, I'm kind of all over the place right now, but um, I, I just remembered something lo looking at this 11 that I would have played with. Morata wasn't playing good that game against Real Madrid. He, he, he didn't play his best game. But a big reason as to why he didn't play a good game was because no one was feeding him. No one was giving him passes. No one was linking up with him because there's no link. There's no direct link from the defense and the midfield to the attack. And that link, it's very simple. He has Angel Correa on the pitch, playing him on the wings. Why don't you just play him as a number 10 and help your striker? That's another thing that Simeone failed to see in this game. You know, it's uh, it's quite obvious. It's quite obvious that Atletico Madrid has a lot of issues. They have issues that aren't... It, it's, it's not just the result that Atletico Madrid has issues with. It's not just losing games and drawing games that you're supposed to be winning. They were outcoached. They were outplayed. They were outthought. It was just bad. But it's a tendency that Diego Simeone has. So that's not really very surprising. But after all of this and watching this game and going to sleep and waking up and the, the next day and kind of thinking of what happened, there are two, two problems that Atletico Madrid has and they have to address immediately. The first one, they have to stop signing quantity over quality. What do I mean by that? I'm going to give you a list of some of the some of the signings that Atletico Madrid has made in these last few years. Thomas Lamar, Alvaro Morata, Alessio Cerchi, Raul Jimenez, Jackson Martinez, Yannick Carrasco, who's actually back, Luciano Vieto, Nico Gaitan, who plays for Chicago Fire, Kevin Gamero. Notice that I mentioned all attacking players. <laughs> there, and, uh, How did I forget Mario Manchukic? I forgot about Mario Manchukic, who is... An incredible striker, a Champions League winner, World Cup finalist, has done it all. Absolutely a great player, lasted one season in Atletico Madrid. Um, they really have to stop signing just to sign. They brought on Joao Felix. Obviously, he was hurt. He couldn't play on Saturday. So that's why I didn't speak about him. But Joao Felix... At 19, probably has to be playing somewhere else. Somewhere where the system benefits him, where he can grow as an attacker, where he can become a better player. When you bring on attackers to, to this system, they drastically drop their level of play. Because all they have to do, be, what they have to do mainly is defend. And that's the second problem. Not only do they just sign quantity over quality. Simeone's system might have seen its better days at Atletico Madrid. Hear me out. It might be crazy, but hear me out. This system was perfect when you were an underdog, when you were a team that didn't attract many players, when you were a team that scraped Europa League spots, when you were a team that made a party when you played Champions League. Now you're a Champions League team season after season. You've been to multiple Champions League finals too. So a couple Champions League finals. You're not a small club anymore. You're not an underdog. Players want to go play with you. Players want to play for Atletico Madrid. And you're still playing like a team that doesn't have great talent so they compensate that with defensive tactics or a good defensive structure 
and good counterattacking. Not anymore, man. I'm sorry, Diego Simeone. You can't play like this when you had Antoine Griezmann, which is a big reason why he left to Barcelona, which whatever, that that it is what it is. When you have players like Antoine Griezmann, or had, now you have Joao Felix, you have Morata, you've had Alessio Cerci, Raul Jimenez, who's killing it at Wolverhampton, Jackson Martinez, who was a beast in the Mexican League, Gianni Carrasco, Luciano Vieto, Gaetan, Gameiro, Manjugic, all these guys. They can't all suck. They can't. There's something flawed with the system. It doesn't benefit attackers. And I think, I think that Simeone's system has probably seen its better days. I think it's time for change. I think it's it's time for new faces. I don't know if this necessarily means that Simeone has to leave Atletico Madrid, but if he's not willing to change, if I were a director at Atletico Madrid, I'd contemplate the idea of letting go of Simeone. And I'd think about it very, very hard because I don't know if I want my club to be mediocre because that is the direction that Atletico Madrid is going towards. They peaked. They peaked like in 2016. That's it. It's all been downhill since. Sure, they won a Europa League. Cool, whatever. But it's just been downhill. And you see the attacking players thrive in other systems at other clubs. They couldn't do it at Atletico. I think it might be time to evaluate Diego Simeone. And if it has to be his last season, so be it. Build him a statue outside of the Wanda Metropolitano Stadium and thank him for everything that he did. But I think it might be time. I think it might be time for Atletico to evaluate Simeone and maybe, perhaps, look for his replacement. So this past Saturday, I got up in the morning to watch Liverpool against Southampton. I just find it very interesting to watch Liverpool now because they could go unbeaten. And it's it, it, it's fun to just watch greatness because you really don't get to see those types of things often. Uh, my mom and I were watching the game and uh, she saw how Liverpool was just getting absolutely dominated in the first half. But my mom knows enough to to know that Liverpool usually always finds a way to win. I told my mom after the first half ended, I'm like, Southampton's probably going to live to regret missing all of these chances. And she's like, yeah, well, I feel like that's what Liverpool does all the time or whenever I watch them. She said, Liverpool just kind of waits and they score whenever they feel like it. They just always win. And then she just got up and went to the store. (laughs) She came back once the game was over. (laughs) She's like, what was the score? What happened? And I'm like, oh, Liverpool ended up winning (laughs) 4-0. And she just kind of chuckled. And she asked who scored the goals. And I told her, oh, well, Salah scored too. She, by the way, for the record, she absolutely hates Mohamed Salah. I don't know why, but she said that she feels like he tries to copy Messi and all his gestures and the way that he plays or whatever. (laughs) Take it easy on my mom, please. Um, (laughs) but she knew she's a casual fan and she knew she knew what was going to happen she knew that Liverpool was not going to lose at home are you kidding me they weren't going to lose that game she knew she knew that greatness was going to take over eventually and they were going to find a way to win it happens that's what happens now let's go to Germany the Bundesliga I talked about the Bundesliga a few weeks ago And I remember I was very excited because Bayern Munich was not in first place. And I was like, I I secretly thought to myself, this could be it. This could be the season where Bayern Munich finally gets dethroned. And we finally get to see a new team crown themselves as Bundesliga champions. Ha ha ha. No. Bayern Munich. Everyone went crazy because of the crisis. Niko Kovac is gone. Bayern Munich lacks depth. 
Joshua Kimmich wants more players. Thomas Mueller wants out. Panic, panic, panic. Bayern Munich erased them from the Bundesliga title race. Everyone forgot that the point difference was like four. So it was nothing. And then they're like, all right, let's go back to basics. Let's just play. Let's just win these games. And they started winning, and they started winning, and winning, and winning. Winter break, whatever. We'll regroup again. They come back, win, win, win. And they're in first place. (laughs) They're on top of the Bundesliga all of a sudden. (laughs) They're on top of the Bundesliga again. Because, of course, the teams that were in first in first place, like Leipzig and Mönchengladbach, suddenly decide to just play bad. That's the difference between a good, a good team and a great team. Great teams find a way to win. Bayern Munich found a way to win these games and get back on top where they belong. Because that, that's where they belong. Let's just be honest. That's where Bayern Munich belongs. At the top of the Bundesliga. That's exactly where they belong. And now, Bayern Munich and Leipzig play this weekend. And it's going to be fun. Because if I was a betting man, which I am not, but if I was, I'd put my money on Bayern Munich. They're probably going to win. I'd even put my money on Bayern Munich winning the league. Here's a hot take. If Bayern Munich wins this weekend, just end the league. It's over. It's done. It is done. Greatness took over once again. They found a way to win. And they're just going to win the Bundesliga again. Should they win this weekend against Leipzig? Very possible because they play in Munich. And now let's talk about Real Madrid. We talked about Atletico and their problems. Now let's talk about Real Madrid. A team that silently, they don't make much noise. At least this season, they they haven't said much. They haven't really been very flashy, very flamboyant. They just got the job done. Again, as I was watching the game, and I addressed this in the previous segment, I talked about how Real Madrid was very narrow. They had no surprise factor to them. They were, uh, they were very... Eh. That's how I described Zidane a couple weeks ago. But they were very, eh, like, all right, cool. In the first half. Then Zinedine Zidane quietly took a mental note. And he's like, all right. Well, I guess if we attack him through the wings, we can probably win this game. Even if we don't win this game, we'll probably be able to scare them a little bit. We'll just play a little better. We'll get a goal eventually. So, without saying much. Makes the substitutions. Vinicius, Lucas Vazquez, who links up for the goal. Ferland Mendy and Vinicius, they team up against Thomas Lamar. Poor guy, couldn't do anything. Mendy, diagonal ball to Benzema, slots it home, 1-0. That's all she wrote. Real Madrid, top of the, not the Bundesliga, top of La Liga. Silent Assassins. Those were the most dangerous ones. The great team ended up winning. The great team ended up addressing their problems. Fixing them. And winning the game. Because that's what great teams do. What am I trying to get out of this? Great teams find a way to win if you guys don't understand the message here. Great teams will always find a way to win. Great teams. Players will always take their team out of the hole they dug themselves into and give them a victory. It happened with Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. And it happens with all these great players. Mohamed Salah, he did it. Diego Alcantara, he did it with Bayern Munich this weekend. Lewandowski just finds a way to score all the damn time. How does he do it? Who knows? But he always scores. He's always there. Karim Benzema. To some, he might not be great. But goddamn, has he been scoring a lot of goals this season. And it's these great players with for these great teams scoring at the appropriate times, showing up at the appropriate times. That's what great teams do. That's what great players do. 
And that's what great people do. They show up when adversity hits. They don't panic. We got this. We've been here before. We know what it takes. We've seen trouble. We know how to cope with it. It's okay. It's fine. We've we've lived this before. We live for situations like this. Liverpool got out of that hole one for nothing. Bayern Munich streaked a couple wins. Top of the Bundesliga. Real Madrid made substitutions. Beat Atletico. Top of La Liga. Sometimes greatness just takes over. The January transfer window is officially over, and this was somewhat silent until the final week of the actual window. And just like everything in life, there are winners, there are losers, so I picked my winners and my losers of this January transfer window. But before I begin to give you guys my selections, I have a criteria for how I picked these teams and players. You are considered a winner in this transfer window if you address your needs or you ended up where you wanted to be. That goes for teams and players. You are a loser if you either stayed at the club that you wanted to leave so bad or you didn't acquire any of your main targets. Simple, straightforward, let's start. First winner, Inter Milan. They are racing Juventus for that Serie A title, the Scudetto. That is such a beautiful word. I love it, the Scudetto. Um, and they brought Christian Eriksen. They brought Ashley Young. So they took some talent from the Premier League. Well, when I say Ashley Young and talent don't really belong in the same sentence. But anyway, Christian Eriksen will clearly elevate this team. Antonio Conte got exactly what he wanted. And all of a sudden... Inter Milan is creeping up on Juventus. But then again, going back to this last segment, greatness could just take over and maybe Juventus could uh, could just run away with, with this league. But Inter Milan could make a very strong case this season and next season. Good transfer windows both in the summer and in January. A loser, Barcelona. The, Barcelona just pisses me off. Barcelona pisses me off. They need it. They they need a striker. It's obvious. They need a striker. Lionel Messi's not a striker. Ansu Fati's not a striker. Luis Suarez is hurt. And Usman Dembele, by the, uh, at the time that I'm recording this, he was coming back from an injury. He gets hurt again. I mean, what the hell is this guy made of? Seriously. This guy just gets hurt and hurt. And I saw someone compare... Dembele to Gareth Bale have some respect for Gareth Bale he is a three-time Champions League winner he scored in the final in Lisbon and in the final in Kiev have some respect for Mr. Gareth Bale Barcelona did not address any of their needs and they let go of Carles Alenia and Carles Perez for whatever reason they don't like anyone named Carles so they just let them go and their squad got a little bit more narrow the depth is no longer there, not that it ever was this season, the selection is going to be a little tougher, tougher games are coming up, Barcelona, what are you doing, what are you thinking, no striker, no hope, this season is a write-off for Barcelona, I would, I would be very surprised if they win any trophies this season, I would be very, very, very surprised, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I'm going to be shocked if they win anything This season, Barcelona isn't in the condition to win absolutely anything. Terrible transfer window. They didn't get anyone. They were supposed to get like Timo Werner or something. Timo Werner, he's staying for another few months to finish off the Bundesliga at Leipzig. Another winner for this January transfer window. Winner number two, Borussia Dortmund and Erling Haaland. I bunched them together because it's a win-win for both. Borussia Dortmund is... uh, is a team that likes to buy cheap, sell very expensive. That's what we all like to do. And their player is showing out. This guy has been playing incredible. He has scored in every single game that he has played in this season in the Bundesliga. This kid's just incredible. And of course, 
Haaland wins because he gets the exposure of the German league. Uh, if I'm being honest and a little bit douchey, no one watches the Austrian league. So, I mean, yeah. And no, over here in the state, it's easier to watch the Bundesliga. So he gets that exposure. And that price tag is going to skyrocket if Real Madrid or Barcelona. Well, Barcelona, apparently they don't need a striker. So Barcelona is not going to knock on Dortmund's door. But uh, if Manchester United is interested again <laughs> after they got rejected, who knows? They have no dignity. But if they come back and they knock, that price tag is going to be a very very high so they both win they both win a loser Edinson Cavani a loser yes a loser in this transfer window because he wanted to leave PSG there was a lot of talk a lot of rumbling Atletico Madrid wanted him they wanted Edinson Cavani because his contract is running up running out at PSG He's not getting many minutes because Mauro Icardi just took over. And Cavani's like, I want out. I want to go to Atletico Madrid. And Atletico Madrid's like, <clears throat> yes, but no. We're okay. So he ended up staying. He's not going to get many minutes. And he's probably going to play in the MLS come June or July. Cavani... Man, I, I feel for him. I feel for him, but that's what happens when you go to PSG. A winner, Bruno Fernandes. Finally, after months and months and months, finally, he went to Manchester United. <laughs> Maybe he wants out already. <laughs> he has no idea what he got himself into. Um, but finally, finally, he it was his dream. It's funny. I find it hilarious when these players arrive. It's been, it's been my dream to play for this team. No, it hasn't, dude. It hasn't been your dream. Stop lying to yourself and to the people. <laughs> but anyway, Bruno Fernandes, he probably did want to play for Manchester United. Finally, finally, it was made this past week. Manchester United got their guy, but they're still struggling. But regardless, Bruno Fernandes is considered a winner in this January transfer window. A loser. Chelsea, what are you doing? The transfer ban has been lifted. You can start buying players now. They didn't buy anyone. What the hell? Are you supposed to get like a new goalkeeper or something? They didn't get anyone. They didn't they didn't get any mids, they didn't get any center backs, they didn't get any strikers, wingers, fullbacks, nothing. They're like we'll pass. All right. Whatever. I mean, I guess and Frank Lampard calls himself the underdog in this top four race in the Premier League well yeah you didn't sign anyone you didn't enhance your team you are technically an underdog it'd be funny if they just fall off a of fourth place and end up like a ninth anyway the last winner on my list Tottenham Hotspur not just because their newest signing scored a beauty of a goal this Sunday against Manchester City but because they addressed their needs they needed a little bit more more attackers so they brought on Steven Burwine and now Hunming Son has adopted a bit of a of a false nine ish striker ish role, so he can he can take over for um, for Harry Kane when he is injured. He's going to be injured for a while, so they have him to play. They kind of address two needs in one, and they made Lo Celso's loan a permanent deal. So that's uh, that's. That's good. He's been finding himself in the starting 11 quite often with Jose Mourinho in charge. And uh, Gelson Fernandez is, of course, another player that found himself now in Tottenham at Tottenham Hotspur. So they they, they got some good signings. I, I'd, I'd say that Tottenham is definitely a winner. And it looks like maybe... This season won't be as bad as we thought it was going to be in October or even early November. The final loser of this January transfer window, Thomas Lamar. Poor guy. Poor guy. He got double teamed against Real Madrid. Vinicius and Mendy just toyed with him. They just passed the ball around and they they scored. And Thomas Lamar rarely gets any minutes at Atletico Madrid. He doesn't get much. He's been... What a lot of people like to call a flop. Arsenal wanted him. 
Arsenal wanted Thomas Lamar, and Atletico's like, mm, nah, we're not going to sell him. We're going to keep him on the bench, but we're going to keep him. So poor Thomas Lamar doesn't get any minutes, doesn't get to go where he wants. He is going to stay at Atletico Madrid for a few more months, and it's probably going to suck for him. But yeah, those are the winners. Those are the losers. If you have anything else, any other winners, any other losers, let me know in the comments or on my social media. This is it. The January transfer window came and went. Now, your clubs better start figuring it out for July. And that'll do it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so, so much for joining me yet again on this new episode of VMFC. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you all had some fun after the Super Bowl hangover and uh, you guys all had to go back to work on that Monday and it's probably going to suck to go back to work for this whole week because you wish it was Super Bowl week, but it is not. Ha ha ha. <laughs> all right, you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Alex Perez FC. Again, follow us on Twitter and on Instagram at Veterans Minimum. And that is it from me. Let's see the notes, the beautiful notes that I made. Yep, that is it. That is all. Thank you all so much, ladies and gentlemen. Take care, and I guarantee you there's going to be more facial hair right here by next week. Take care. Goodbye.